Hey everyone, it's Dr. Andrew Wolf here with Health Ed Solutions, and today's lesson is on hypoxemia, and it's part of a series on interpreting ABGs. Don't forget to visit us online at healthedsolutions.com for more free content. Now let's get started. So there are two values in an arterial blood gas that relate directly to oxygenation. One is the partial pressure of oxygen, and the normal value is 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And the other is the oxygen saturation with normal values of 92 to 100%. Now, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to define hypoxemia as the amount of oxygen that can be carried in the blood. And we can determine this by these two values and the hemoglobin concentration. Using the formula, carrying capacity of oxygen equals the hemoglobin concentration times a constant of 1.34, which is the amount of oxygen, the mLs of oxygen that can be carried per gram of hemoglobin, times the oxygen saturation, plus the partial pressure of oxygen times 0 0.003, which is a constant that relates to the amount of oxygen in mLs that can be dissolved in blood. So what's interesting about this equation is it tells you it tells you all the components that relate to hypoxemia or the amount of oxygen that can be carried in blood. So I just want to kind of go through what this would look like with relatively normal values. So say we have a hemoglobin of 12 grams per deciliter times a constant of 1.34 milliliters of oxygen per gram times an oxygen saturation of 96% plus a PaO2 of 90 millimeters of mercury times a constant of 0 0.003. And what we end up with is a value of 15 milliliters per deciliter plus, rounding up, about 0 0.3 milliliters per deciliter, or a total of 15.3. So this is the amount of oxygen that is carried in blood. And you can see of this 15.3, only 0.3 is coming from the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood, and about 50 times that is being carried, saturated, or bound with hemoglobin. So when we are thinking about hypoxemia, there's a few major factors that are that you can see within this equation. First of all, the PaO2 is very important, and the way the PaO2 relates to oxygen saturation, and it relates based on the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which you can read about in another video. Normally, um, oxygen saturation is above normal as long as the PO, PaO2 is above is greater than 60. This isn't always the case because the curve can shift to the left or the right. And again, I have another video about that um, that you can review those concepts. So we have the PaO2, we have the oxygen saturation. We have this constant here, which is a constant as long as things are normal. It can vary. There are some things that can cause changes to this um, oxygen binding uh, coefficient, and those are things like carbon monoxide poisoning or met hemoglobinemia. And then we also need to consider um, the hemoglobin concentration of the blood as well. Now I group the causes of hypoxemia into three different groups. The first, hypoventilation. The most common cause that I see 
causing hypoventilation in the inpatient setting is CNS depression. depression caused by CNS depressant medications, like narcotics. The next major cause is neuromuscular causes, like myasthemia gravis, or Guillain-Barre, etc. The second major class that causes hypoxemia are things that decrease the hemoglobin carrying capacity. And the first most common cause of this is anemia. So you decrease the amount of, of hemoglobin and you decrease the amount of oxygen carrying capacity with this part of the equation. And then the second part are things that decrease the binding, uh, their binding limitations on hemoglobin itself. And there's two major causes of this. One is carbon monoxide poisoning. And then the other is methemoglobinemia. And I'm not going to go into the um, pathophysiology of methemoglobinemia uh, much, but just suffice it to say that methemoglobinemia um, usually occurs because there's something that's interfering with an enzyme that changes methemoglobin back to normal hemoglobin that's capable of carrying oxygen. So this occurs in newborns that don't have um, sufficient quantities of that enzyme, or more commonly with adults, it, uh, it occurs because there are medications or toxins that are interfering with the action of that enzyme, such as dapsone or hydrochloroquine. Okay, I'm just going to make some space here. This um, The third class is the largest and requires some more in-depth explanation. And these are things that increase the AA gradient or the alveolar arterial gradient. And of this category, there are, again, three major causes. Okay, to understand this, we need to talk a little bit about how oxygen gets from the alveoli. And imagine these little blue dots are molecules of oxygen, and they need to cross a thin membrane between the alveoli. And they diffuse across into the artery. And typically, a alveoli that has plenty of oxygen will diffuse into an artery that, um, and it, it occurs normally. Now imagine if, if you have an alveoli with just a little bit of oxygen, through a process called pulmonary vasoconstriction, the arterioles sort of squeeze down so the there's so there's very little blood flow if there's not a lot of oxygen so this is called hypoxic vasoconstriction and this is what allows us to main, maintain a balance between ventilation and perfusion now there are some disease processes that can lead to a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. And what happens is if you have low oxygen, just a few, you can see, and normal blood flow, you don't have hypoxic vasoconstriction, then you're going to have low V and normal Q, and you're going to have a VQ mismatch. And what hap this can happen in certain inflammatory conditions or chronic conditions, like pneumonia, for instance, where you have um, a disease that's causing inflammation that, may, that prevents that um, hypoxic vasoconstriction. And so you have hypoxic alveoli um, with very little oxygen diffusing into the arteries. You have lots of blood with, that has very little, bit of, very little oxygen,
that's flowing back to the heart. And overall, as the blood mixes together, this poorly oxygenated blood is going to mix with the other blood, and it's going to drop the overall PaO2 of the blood returning to the heart. And that is the first cause, which is called VQ mismatch. And I'm just going to say when V does not equal Q, or ventilation does not e equal perfusion. So that's the first cause of an of AA gradient. Now the second cause is really, it's called a shunt, and it's really an extreme version of a VQ mismatch where you have no oxygen at all reaching the alveoli, and you still have plenty of blood flow, so you have no, ox no oxygenated blood at all. So you end up with blood that's going back to the heart that has a PaO2 of zero, and when it mixes with the rest of the blood, when there's a significant shunt like that, then you're going to end up with very, very low um, oxygen in the blood and very low oxygen saturation. Now the third cause is a diffusion abnormality, which is caused by a thickening of the alveolar arterial membrane. And when you have this thickening of the alveolar arterial membrane, you end up with what's called a diffusion deficit. And this is caused typically by chronic diseases like emphysema or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or sarcoidosis. Now, to some degree, um, acute conditions like significant pulmonary edema can increase the thickness of the relative thickness of the alveolar arterial membrane. There are some conditions that actually have um, multiple components of this. For instance, a um, pneumonia can cause a significant VQ mismatch um, and shunt in some places, and pulmonary edema can cause a diffusion deficiency and a VQ mismatch because you have alveoli alveoli that are filled with fluid and can't be filled with oxygen, etc. But these are the three major causes of increased art alveolar arterial gradient, a VQ mismatch, a shunt, and a diffusion abnormality. Okay, now before we finish, uh, I want to talk about one other piece of information that's very important to consider when you're thinking about hypoxemia, and that's the FiO2. That's the fraction of inspired oxygen saturation. And this isn't a measurement from the ABG itself. This is the amount of oxygen that the patient is breathing in. So if they're breathing in room air, their fraction of, ox of inspired oxygen is about 21%. And this increases as you put them on um, two liters or you put them on an underbreather, et cetera. They're going to be breathing more and more oxygen. And it's important to consider that the level of respiratory failure relates to the relationship between the fraction of inspired oxygen and the PaO2 in the blood. Because if you have if you have someone on a non-rebreather and their PaO2 is still 80 or less, that means that they have a hypoxic respiratory failure. So there's a value called the PF ratio that allows us to look at the uh, fraction of inspired oxygen and its relationship to the PaO2. So that basically is the PaO2 divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen expressed as a fraction. So if we have someone who is has a PaO2 of 100 with who's breathing on room air, so just average it out to a fraction of inspired oxygen 0.2, then we'd have a PF ratio of about 500. If the PF ratio gets below 300, then that is considered acute respiratory failure. So if we increased this, if someone was had a PaO2 of 100, but they were on 50% oxygen, then they would have a PF ratio of 200 which would mean they had respiratory failure. So looking at that relationship between the FiO2 and the PaO2 is an important way to 
to look at the overall function of the lung. And this really tells you a lot about what's going on with the AA gradient. So this tells you, you know, if a patient is on um, high levels of oxygen and they've got lots of oxygen, a high oxygen concentration in the alveoli, but they still have low concentration of oxygen in the bloodstream, then there's a significant issue with a de an increased AA gradient, which represents um, lung failure. So pay attention to the PF ratio. Um, it's very important to consider both sides of that equation, both the amount of oxygen the patient is breathing as well as the PaO2 of their blood. That's it for our lesson today. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to please like and subscribe below.